At this time, I am pleased to introduce Kate Snow. Kate Snow is the anchor of NBC News, Nightly News on Sundays and an award-winning senior national correspondent for NBC News. Snow's career embodies Iona College's motto, Fight the Good Fight, and her reporting has provided insight, made significant impact, and brought needed attention to issues around the country. Her pursuit of knowledge and truth, her devotion to integrity, diversity, and freedom of inquiry closely align with the college's mission and values. A little later in the ceremony, Ms. Snow will receive an honorary doctoral degree from Iona College. A full citation of Kate Snow's life and accomplishments can be found in the back of our commencement program. I present to you Ms. Kate Snow. Thank you so much. Thank you, Provost. Thank you, Mr. President. Hi, everybody. How are you all doing? Good. Excellent. How, how are the graduates? Yeah? OK. I'm just making sure everybody's OK today. Congratulations. Uh, so I am a journalist, uh, like he said. I don't know if you've heard, uh, but journalism is kind of under attack right now, just a, just a little bit. The president of the country has called us fake and dishonest and even the enemy of the American people. Um, he once tweeted directly at the show that I anchor on Sunday night, Nightly News, and called us, quote, so biased, inaccurate, and bad, point after point. I wore it as a badge of honor. He's watching, right? <laughs> The president has successfully convinced a lot of Americans, and a lot of Americans think that they should not trust us as journalists. And on top of that, there are, as you know, a whole lot of illegitimate sources of information on the internet right now. I'm sure when you guys were doing research in your graduate degrees that you found a lot of stories that were paid, you know, people were paid to write things that were simply not true, just clickbait headlines. You've probably all encountered that. So today, in addition to talking to you guys about life outside Iona, I want to talk a little bit about uh, journalism, and, and not just that legitimate journalists are not fakety-fake, because we're not, but I'm here to argue that what we do, what I do every single day as a journalist, actually matters more than ever. And whether you're here because you're getting a communication degree, which I know a lot of you, a number of you are, there we go. Um, or whether you're here for some other program, I think the skills that journalists have and use every single day might actually help you navigate the world. So bear with me as I explain. Um, I see my job as basically digging in, reaching deep, forging human connections while sharing stories that otherwise might go overlooked. And I'm also an, kind of an old school journalist, which does not necessarily mean I'm old. Although, I, thank you, I got one laugh in front here. Um, but, I, but I'm old school, which means that I don't think it's my job to preach. I don't think it's my job to shout at people or, or give my opinion on the news. I believe that I should be objective. But I also live in the same divided world that you do. I do have debates with my family and my close friends about how to navigate the world we're all living in that moves so fast and how to raise my two kids in that world and in a divided country. And every time I have those debates, I find myself relying on journalism skills, instincts to get me through those hard conversations. So I'm gonna share a few of those instincts with you. First, I'm going to start with just a quick story, if you guys don't mind. The other day, I'm in this kind of intense hot yoga class. Anyone? <laughs> I am not good at hot yoga. I, I'm totally inflexible, and I, I don't judge me for that, please. But I'm in this kind of half-baked downward dog situation. When I start hearing the first few notes of that 1999 song, I know you, get, you were probably younger, so maybe you don't remember, but it was the New Radicals. The song was You Get What You Give. And I heard it, and it jarred a memory in my head, which was when I was a newbie reporter for CNN, a division of CNN back then, they had sent me over for my very first overseas assignment to Kosovo and war had broken out there. It was early spring 1999, it was cold, it was damp, and to be honest, I was terrified. 
I felt like I didn't know what I was doing. I felt separated from my surroundings, like an outsider looking in. I didn't speak the language. I didn't understand the culture. Let me give you an example. In Albania and Kosovo, this means no, and this means yes. Just a small example. I'm sitting there uncomfortable as a stranger, and my job is to ask people about, frankly, the worst you know, tragedy they'd ever lived through. Uh, they'd been just displaced from their homes, and they were refugees from a war, and I had to ask them how that felt. And then as I was trying to figure out what to do, this old beat up hatchback pulls up, Eastern European car, and this guy's driving it and he's our fixer, which is what we call somebody in TV who's like a local person who's gonna help us get around and knows the way. I cram into the back seat next to a producer, sandwiched between a producer and a camera guy, and what's on the radio? The new radicals, you get what you give. And in that instant, I thought to myself, okay, they're not that different than I am. It was my favorite song at that moment. It was his favorite song at that moment. And I know that sounds simplistic, but it, it, something switched in my head. I could find common ground with all these people that I had to cover. So I listened to them cry about losing their homes and telling me about what their lives were like before that war broke out. And I played with their kids and I treated them with respect. And I was able to report on them and their situations with, I think, a level of empathy. And that is lesson number one, is respect begets respect, all through life. Jacob was an energetic little five-year-old boy who was really eager to show me his toys in his bedroom. Jacob has a short buzz cut hairdo, and you wouldn't know from looking at him that he was gender identified female when he was born. When Jacob was two years old, he started telling his parents, I'm a boy, I'm a boy, my name is Jacob. Not just once, but persistently, consistently, insistently. Jacob's story was part of a series that I did for Nightly News a few years ago and for the Today Show, uh, all about kids who are transgender. And a couple of weeks ago, I was on another shoot downtown here in New York and interviewing a young person in a clothing store that is um, gender neutral clothing. And the manager came over and asked and thanked me for telling Jacob's story those years ago. But you don't have to be on TV to help people learn from people and accept and respect each other. Once the people in your life know that you're gonna treat them with dignity and respect no matter what, I think they're more likely to open up to you. I think respect has a domino effect, right? So here's something I would encourage all the graduates and anyone, actually anyone in here to do, is just seek out someone who has a vastly different life from yours. Take them to lunch, have a cup of coffee, sit down and talk with them, treat them with respect. And that kind of leads to my, my second point, journalism lesson number two. Try to see things from multiple perspectives. Don't rush to take sides. I think one reason that our nation is so divided right now is that we, we tend to see things as black and white. One group's right, the other group is wrong, it's completely binary, like there's nothing in between. But the truth is that the issues that I cover every day, they're really complex. And often they're more complex than we like to believe. And often there's more than one way to read a set of facts. There might be lots of ways. In the newsroom, we constantly ask, what's the alternative view of the universe on this? Like, just to kind of make ourselves think of the other side. And that question, I think, applies to real life. I grew up in upstate New York in a great family with a really happy childhood. But when I was paired with a little sister through Big Brothers Big Sisters, when I was working in local news in Albuquerque, New Mexico, that opened my mind. It was so different than my life experience to that point that I saw the world differently. And here's the third thing that I think that journalism can kind of teach, hopefully teach all of us, the power of shining a light. I can still picture a guy named Travis Weaver he was one of Jerry Sandusky's first victims to do a television interview from Penn State. And he was so pained and fragile in our interview, even though the abuse had occurred 20 years before I sat down with him. Or I can picture nine-year-old Hagen, who I just met a few months ago. He sat with me playing Legos and calmly described what it was like to take care of his three younger siblings. He's nine years old because his mom is still abusing heroin. 
A little boy whose name I never even learned, who was buried under a pile of rubble for five days after the Haiti earthquake, and still managed, when they pulled him out of the rubble after all those days, he managed to give me a huge smile and a thumbs up. We didn't even speak the same language. He was carried away on a stretcher. I have no idea where he is now. Those are the kinds of stories that I cover, and yeah, they are dark, some of them really dark. But the way I see it, those stories need to be told. And I understand the temptation to turn away from the darkness. It's, we all have that temptation, but if we all do that, nothing's ever gonna change. So when we talk out loud about things like opioid abuse or mental health, that's what shines a light. If we talk about suicide out loud, it takes away some of the stigma. And when you talk with people about what they've been through, the other thing that I've kind of learned is it's not depressing. It's actually really hopeful and uplifting because when you shine a light on something, often in the darkness what you find is hope. I saw a new PSA the other day that is fantastic. The theme is Seize the Awkward. Have you guys seen this? You should look it up, Google it later. Seize the awkward. An actor <laughs> pops up in the middle of awkward situations, so like in the cushions of a couch he pops up, or actually two guys are at the urinal and he pops up between them, to make the point that if somebody is having an awkward moment and going through a hard time, you have to seize the awkward and you have to have what might be a really difficult conversation sometimes. And there's one more lesson that I've learned as a journalist, the power of numbers. In the fall of 2014, I was assigned to cover the story about Bill Cosby. That's when one woman made allegations against him. And then you guys know what happened. Then there was another, and then there was another, and then there was another until there were 50, and now we're up to 60. And maybe you saw the interview that I did in, in the summer of 2015 when we gathered 27 women in one room who all had allegations against Bill Cosby. We were in a ballroom. We were in a ballroom in Los Angeles the largest interview I've ever done, the hardest interview I've ever done. We talked for six hours, we took one lunch break in the middle, and as I said, it was one of the most difficult I've ever done, but it was also one of the most moving experiences of my life. And believe it or not, it did not depress me or scare me, I left there feeling uplifted again. When I asked one of them what they would say to Bill Cosby, and again, this is three years ago before the recent trial, one of them said, I'd like to look him in the face and say, you thought you could bury us all, but you didn't know we were seeds. Separately, they had all felt powerless and alone, but once they found each other, they had power. Once one connection is made and another and another, those connections eventually become a community. And instead of one single voice now, you're a chorus. So I'm really hopeful that as you graduate today, you find that power yourselves. Build those solid relationships in your own life and you can accomplish so much more than you ever would on your own. And I, I'm sure you've heard this one already, but let me just say it. Take risks. Seize the little opportunities that come up. Be persistent. When I was told that there was a chance that President Bill Clinton, former President Bill Clinton, might have a seat on a plane on his trip to Africa, I didn't give up until I had that plane seat and went over with him. When I had the opportunity to join an aid caravan from northern Kenya into Somalia, one of the most dangerous places on the planet, I found a way to go and my mom, who is here, was not very happy with me. But when someone, when someone shot up a movie theater in Aurora, Colorado, same thing, I jumped on an airplane because I knew that that story needed to be told and I knew that in a way it was professionally an opportunity. The truth is, I, I would not be standing right here, I would not be anchoring a network newscast if I hadn't had some pretty fierce perseverance, right? When I was in high school, you don't remember this, but 1987, anyone? I had huge hair, like so big that my friends called me Bon Jovi. And I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life at all at that point. And I had had a vague idea that maybe I wanted to be a writer, but then there was this lady, Mrs. C, I'll call her, in seventh grade, who told me that I really wasn't a very good writer. I really, really wish I knew where Mrs. C was now. 
I've been doing a show for the past year called The Drink. Um, that's the title of it. You can find it on YouTube. And the whole idea is I have a drink with someone. It, it can be tea or it can be wine or whatever, whatever their choice. And we talk about how they got to the top of their field. So, I, for example, Jane Goodall, the chimp expert, um, Jane Lynch, the actress from Glee's, you know, the coach, um, Neil deGrasse Tyson, the astrophysicist. These are people that I've sat down with. And every one of them has a story where something happened that could have discouraged them forever from pursuing their dream. But instead, they persevered. Instead, they took risks. So the point is, don't listen to the Mrs. C's of the world. If you think you can do something right now, try it. And that doesn't mean all work all the time and no play. It doesn't mean you have to do everything right away tomorrow either. I'm a big believer in downtime, especially outdoors downtime. Next weekend, my husband and my two kids and I are going backpacking in the Adirondacks. And we unplug completely on those trips. We, we leave the phones in the car, no Snapchat, no Instagram, no Twitter, no internet. I urge you to try that. Go out in the woods, go to the beach, go to a park, take a walk, whatever it is to get you outside. And then my other advice would be, maybe the parents aren't gonna like this, maybe take a break right now before the next big thing, right? I graduated with a master's degree from Georgetown University, the School of Foreign Service, and when I graduated, I had this plan to take a massive road trip across the country with my best friend, who was my housemate at the time, my roommate. And guess what? I got a job, I went straight to the job, and we never did that road trip. And I still wonder what would have happened. I still regret not doing that. There's a lot of time for work. There's less time for human connections. So to steal a page from an unfake journalist, do all you can to make those connections as meaningful as you can. I wish you all years of happiness and great success. Huge congratulations. Thank you.